Good morning. Welcome today. We're going to have our Sunday School lesson online yet, but uh, we're going to get a little bit closer. You know, at least we can come in. We're having services on 8, 9.30, and 11 o'clock on each Sunday, so we can worship together, but we're going to do our Sunday School lesson online, and then some of our classes are going to be meeting with their teachers. So today we get to start a new session in a new book. And the first one is, session one, is sure of forgiveness. You know, are you sure that you have forgiveness? You know, and that's our point that we're going to be studying today, that we are forgiven when we confess our sin and walk with Christ. So let's look at Romans 3, 10 to 12 and for a little bit of an opening here. And Paul writes in Romans, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become useless. There is no one who does what is good, not even one. Folks, that's us, every one of us. If you notice in there, it said the word all. And in our life connection, it says we are sinful, rebellious human beings, and we feel the result, guilt. Don't you feel that in your life, guilt, of things that you maybe have not done, and things that you have done, right? And despite our best efforts, we can't break free of our sin, and guilt can hound us relentlessly. Too many people are driven into despair and hopelessness because of the shame and guilt they feel over sin. Freedom from guilt is possible, though. So let's read this Bible meets life. Okay, we're going, well, Barry, can we be sure? Can we be sure of anything? Well, some philosophers will tell you that they can't. You know, after COVID-19 arrived last year and shook up the everyday routine of life, nothing seems certain. And we're going through it right now again, aren't we? We see everything that's going on in the world, and it's just everything is all shook up, right? But we can have insurance, though. God desires for every believer to have insurance, assurance of salvation. Sadly, Many Christians struggle daily with doubt as it pertains to the eternal destiny. Some even believe it's impossible to know with certainty that a person is eternally saved. You know, at other times, believers who are not sure of their salvation find themselves plunged into depths of doubt and despair. We talked about being dis you know, despairing and things like that you know, with Elijah. Even those kind of, you know, are still go down in despair and uncertain whether or not God has truly forgiven us. You know, others allow their self-condemnation to smother assurance of God and desires for them to have. But we can be assured of assurance. The Apostle John stated this clearly in 1 John 5.13, which states, I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son and God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. You see, we have God's assurance of eternal life even as we have the assurance of our forgiveness. So let's look at this setting. You know, we're coming into a new thing, so we're talking about the Apostle John. And he wrote his first epistles so that followers of Jesus would be certain about their salvation in Christ, which we just read, 1 John 5, 13. And we can know that we have eternal life in Christ. You know, we don't have to fret, worry, you know, or wonder about what's most important. The biblical grounds for our assurance of salvation in Christ is explained through the first epistle of John. You know, for example, John wanted to emphasize the fellowship that we can enjoy with the Father and with Jesus and with the followers of Jesus. We read in 1 John 1, 3 through 4, quote, What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you, so that you may also have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may complete. You know, not only is the Christian life possible, but it's also enjoyable because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Our past is forgiven because of His death and resurrection. Our present and future are now defined by our our relationship with him through the good news of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. That's what gospel means, the good news. Man can be forgiven and enjoy fellowship with God. You know, John marks the path so that we can discover how to experience this incredible opportunity. 
The result, though, will depend upon how we personally respond to the message about Christ. Did you hear? Personally respond. You know, it's great. It's your parents, your grandparents, your brother, your sister, they go to Chase and they're saved. But you're not saved through them. You have to make that personal relationship with Christ your own. And today, we're going to find out how you can do that. In our lifestyle, if, if our lifestyle contradicts our claims that we know Christ, then we're lying to ourselves, which we're going to see in verse 6. If we dispute what we are, that we are sinners in need of a Savior, then we deceive ourselves, which is in verse 8. And if we deny that we have sinned, we contradict God's word and accuse of, basically accusing him of being a liar, which is verse 10. However, if we will confess our sins to the Lord, then he will forgive us, which is verse 9, and we will enjoy a wonderful relationship with God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for this chance to study your word. Lord, speak through me. I pray that you would be glorified and that we would be edified from your word. Lord, if there's someone out there today that doesn't know you, we pray that today would be their day of salvation, that they would hear these words and they would confess their sins because we are all sinners, and they would call on your name to be saved. Lord, we pray this in your holy name. Amen. So let's go to 1 John 1, 5 through 7. Now this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and there is absolutely no darkness in him. If we say we have fellowship with him, yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus' his Son cleanses us from all sin. So important thing to remember here, we are forgiven because Jesus paid the price for us. Not what we do, it's what Jesus did for us. You know, and then John clearly states that this message came from God, not John, and is about God and no one else. John wanted those reading the letter to know the source of the message. You know, there's no confusion here. John said his words were from God and then proceeded to point out who God is, the one who is the light. See, everything is based on the character of God. It is the foundation for our forgiveness. God is holy. He is perfect in every way. There is no sin in him. So to describe God as light reflect, refers not only to his holiness, but also to his moral goodness. That's why when we sin, and we are all sinners, we're born into sin, there's a separation from God for us. And we have and need a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ. And see, God's terms are clear. We are forgiven when we confess our sins and commit ourselves to walk with Christ. In 1 John 1, 1 through 2, John approached the subject of fellowship with God as an eyewitness. It says, what was from the beginning and what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, and what we have observed and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. That life was revealed, and we have seen it, and we testify, and we declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and who is revealed to us. See, John and the apostles, they were eyewitnesses to this. They were with Jesus for three and a half years. So he's telling you right here that he has walked with Christ. He knows him personally, and this is the truth. And now, if you've been saved, let's look at Romans 1, 1 You know that there is power in the gospel. You know, and in this writing, as we look at Romans 1, 6, it says, including yourselves who, oh, I'm sorry, it should be uh, 1, 16, that... The power of the gospel, if I can, if I can remember it, that's, okay. Okay. Oh, as Paul said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is God's power for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also the Greek. And folks, if you've been saved, you know the power of the gospel, how it has changed your life 
that you are a new creation in God. 2 Corinthians 5.17 goes farther with this when Paul writes, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and look, new things have come. So, like I said, we know that the gospel changes lives because you've seen it with your own eyes. And in his writing, he emphasized the experience to give credibility to the testimony of an intimate knowledge of the eternal life we have in Christ. Understanding this message begins with the knowledge of who God is. So let's look at verse 5. Now this is the message we have heard from him and declared to you. God is light and there is absolutely no darkness in him. So now we're going to look at the metaphors of light and darkness that reveal the character of God. As applied to the Father, light describes his absolute glory, truth, and righteousness. God in his nature expresses divine majesty. Perfect revelation and illumination and complete holiness. He is light and in him there are no shadows of darkness at all. For this reason in 1 Timothy 6.16 the Apostle Paul described God in this way. The only one who has immortality dwelling in unapproachable light for no one has seen or can see him to him be honor and eternal might. Amen. So God is light, and there is absolutely no darkness in him. In contrast, humans are a different story, aren't they? You know, in Romans 3, 23, it states we all fall short of God's glory because of our sin. So the indictment of sin in the human race is very clear. And we see that evidence and read it while ago in Romans 3, verses 10 through 12, that there is none righteous, no, not even one, there is no one who understands, and there is no one who seeks God. You know, as a result, God is unapproach unapproachable in His holiness. But despite the separation between God and man, John boldly declared that we can have fellowship with God. He wanted us to hear the good news about fellowship with God made possible through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Folks, that's the good news of the gospel. So, and we see this in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. So, however, whether or not we enjoy the opportunity to have fellowship with God, it depends on our response to this message. When we understand that God is light and that we are walking in darkness, we are confronted with the reality of our sin. Knowing our sin is vital, for then we realize that we are in relationship to a holy God, that we are in darkness and He is in light, but we can respond to this knowledge. The natural response of mankind has been to avoid the light and remain in darkness. Let's look at John 3, 19, 20. And Jesus said, This then is the judgment. The light has come into the world, which is Jesus. And people love, but the people love darkness. So rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. So we have that in this, don't we? We know what's right or wrong. We have that conscience and that guilt feeling. But yet sometimes we still would rather be in the darkness than in the light. So as John clearly spelled out for us the decision that everyone must face, what will we do when we are confronted with the reality of sin before a holy God? Will we deny the truth? Will we lie to God and deceive ourselves? You understand if you've lived on this earth for very long that it's easy to drift away in darkness rather than light and live in light. You know, think about this. When you're first born, I don't know how many of you have uh, watched the movie Gravity when they're basically stranded in space and they keep drifting farther away. That's how we are when we first born. You know, we keep drifting farther away from God. You know, we, until we admit that we're sinners and turn from them sins and ask His forgiveness and call on His name, we're lost and we're going to keep falling farther and farther away. So to avoid drifting in the darkness... John shared some very pointed counsel. 
We simply must have knowledge and be willing to listen to his wise counsel. Let's look at verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him, yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and not practicing the truth. So if we claim to know God and our character does not match his, then we are lying about walking God. Remember to know him who is light is to walk in his ways. How do we know that? By reading his word, by praying to him, talking to him, and listening to his voice. But you need to be in his word. That is the truth, folks. Let's look at verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he himself is, is the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. Notice the emphasis. The blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. When we come to Jesus the light and leave the darkness, as a result of what God does for, his, for us, his blood cleanses us from all sin and makes fellowship with him possible. Without Jesus, we would be unable to have fellowship with God. It is not any work of ours that makes us able to have relationship, only his work with us. That's what it's all about. It's all that what Jesus did for us. It's, we can't save ourselves by our works. It's by Jesus' finished work on the cross. And in the past, even in the Old Testament, as we read, before Jesus, the Israelites would sacrifice for the sins. You know, they would, there would have to be blood of the animal to atone for their sins. But once Jesus came and he died on the cross for us, that was the atonement for all of our sins, that we never had to sacrifice another animal for that. Jesus did it all for us. When he said to tell us die on the cross, he said that the debt of sin was paid in full. So forgiveness of sin is only possible through the blood of Jesus Christ. Without his sacrificial death and resurrection, mankind would still be separated from God because of sin. Let's look at Colossians 1, 19 through 22. And Paul writes, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds, expressed in your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death, to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. Thanks to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we can now enjoy fellowship with God. So let's look at the lasting truths from this first part, verses 5 through 7. First off, God is holy, righteous, and perfect. Secondly, the indictment of sin in the human race is very clear. We are all sinners, fall, we fall short of the grace of God. Thirdly, whether or not we enjoy the opportunity to have fellowship with God depends on our response to the message. And fourthly, forgiveness of sin is only possible through Jesus' blood. Let's move on to 1 John verse 8 through 10. So if we say we have no sin... We are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So a point to remember here as we go through this section, we are forgiven because Jesus is faithful and righteous. So let's look at Hebrews 9.22. The shed blood of Jesus on the cross covers our sin, and according to the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So for this reason, forgiveness of sin is available to all who receive the gift of eternal life by faith. Once we receive Christ's sacrifice on our behalf by faith, then he is faithful and righteous to forgive us on the grounds of his shed blood on the cross. Jesus loves and demonstrated that love when he died on the cross for us. Romans 5, 8 says, But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
The message of his blood is that anyone can come to him to be forgiven of his or her sins. When a sinner comes to the Savior, he or she experiences the forgiveness of God. Even in Revelation 1.5, Jesus says, Who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood. So even though forgiveness is available to everyone, anyone, the path to Christ begins with humbly confessing our sins to the Lord. And Jesus illustrated this truth in the parable about the Pharisee and the tax collector that was in Luke 18, 9 through 14, which reads, He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. Two men went up to the temple complex to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee took his stand and was praying like this, God, thank you that I'm not like other people that are greedy, unrighteous, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of everything I get. But the tax collector standing far off would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his chest and saying, God, turn your wrath for me, a sinner. I tell you, this one went down to his house justified rather than the other, because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So as you see there the difference, the tax collector knew that he was a sinner and that he needed God. But yet the Pharisee thought that he was righteous in his own religion and he didn't need it that he was getting to heaven on his own. So in other words, the only way out of the darkness into the light requires us to confess our sins to God so that he will extend mercy and forgiveness to us. If we do not meet this condition, then forgiveness cannot be extended to us. And that's why John warned those who refused to confess their sin to God. In verse 8, he said, If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. See, John emphasized those who deny the presence of sin in their lives are merely deceiving themselves. You know, we're taught in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There are no exceptions. Let's look at verse 10 here. We're going to skip 9 for a moment. You know, in the same way, verse 10 says, If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. The claim of sin is not only a denial of the truth. A person's claim that he or she has not sinned is simply a lie. You know, Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, in this way death spread to all people, because all have sinned. Have you ever had to teach your child how to sin, or how to lie, or maybe how to take something? No, we're born into it. When you look at our little grandchildren or children would say little angels but then you know you start thinking those little angels they sure get in a lot of trouble right and if you look back in your life of the things you did before you came to know Christ you lived the way the flesh of the world is and if you read his word you know you're not doing you're not living by God's word and you're not living in the light now do we still stumble after we've come to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, sure. But he is right there at the ready to forgive us of our sins. You know, and according to teaching of Scripture, death is a result of sin. The wages of, death, or the wages of sin is death in 623 Romans. And we all fall short of the glory of God. When humans sinned against God, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Think of David, he wrote in Psalm 51, 5, when David confessed his sin to God, he acknowledged that people are sinful from birth. So as a result, people make God into a liar when they deny that they have sinned. You know, when God judges the world, someday all will be found guilty of sin before a holy God. But those who have received the benefit of the blood of Jesus Christ by faith will be pardoned. Let's read verse 9. So again, the path to forgiveness begins with the confession of sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the law condemns every one of us as a sinner. 
because by the works of the law, no human being will be justified. But on the other hand, as in Galatians 2, 16, by the works of the law, which on the other hand, the law was given to raise our awareness and to give us knowledge of sin. Without the confession of sin, we remain separated from holy God who sent his son on our behalf. And we will remain in darkness while he is in the light. But if we confess our sins to God, we are agreeing with him that we have done wrong. It is only when we agree with God about our sin is he able to work on our behalf. Those who deny sin remain deceived. And those who refuse to admit their behavior are accusing God of lying about their sinfulness. You know, we have promise as we read Proverbs 23 or 28, 13, which states, The one who conceals his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them will find mercy. The blessing about confession is that God promises forgiveness. God will be faithful to keep his promise because he is righteous. Not only will he forgive the penalty of sin, but he will also cleanse us from our sin. Let's look at the lasting truths from this part from verses 8 through 10. First, once we conceive or we receive Christ's sacrifice on our behalf by faith, then he is faithful and righteous to forgive us on the grounds of his shed blood on the cross. Secondly, when we confess our sins to God, we are agreeing with him that we have done wrong. Thirdly, the blessing and reason for confession is because God promises forgiveness. And God never breaks a promise. And fourthly, God will be faithful to keep his promise because he is righteous and in him is no darkness. Now we're going to go to 1 John 2, 1 through 2. Once you're saved, you still will stumble, as we said, and now we're going to find out what happens during this period of time. And John writes, My little children, I am writing you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the Righteous One. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. So remember this as we go through this. We are forgiven because Jesus stands as our advocate. He died for our sins, then he rose from the dead to live evermore. As we read Romans 5, 9 through 10, it says, How much more then, since we have been justified by his blood, will be saved through him from him wrath? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more, have, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? So not only are we saved by Jesus' death, we are also saved by his life. The our Savior lives and is now our advocate with the Father in heaven. You know, the Apostle John warned his readers about against sin, but now he comforted them with this precious truth, which is in verse 1. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. You know, we have become a child of God, so our, you know, our status has changed with God. The word advocate means to be one called alongside of another, a helper, a legal counsel, like our lawyer. And Jesus comes to the Father to intercede on our behalf. See, because we are sinners, God is our judge. But however, now that since we are saved, He is also, we are children of God. He is our Father. So now that we are children of God, Jesus is our Savior and our advocate, our lawyer. And as an advocate, Jesus reminds his father that he shed his blood for all of our sins. Let's look at Hebrews 4, 15, 16, because the writer of the Hebrews emphasizes Jesus' work as a high priest on our behalf. And it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tested in every way as we were, yet without sin. Remember, Jesus was fully human, fully God, he lived a life, but yet he did not sin. Verse 16, Therefore let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us at the proper time. When we sin, we can go to the Lord for grace. He understands us because he is the Son of God and the Son of Man. 
And because our high priest Jesus Christ lives forever, we can take comfort that our advocate will always be there for us. You know, knowing Jesus as our advocate is vital to experiencing victory in the Christian life. You know, when we look in the book of Revelation, we see that Scripture calls Satan the accuser of our brothers and sisters. For example, Satan accuses us before God whenever we sin. Imagine this discouragement and defeat, knowing that he's up there telling God the Father who knows all things and knows that we are sinning about us, that we're not worthy. But who do we have up there? We have Jesus Christ as our advocate at the right hand of the Father. So every time that Satan makes an accusation against a child of God, Jesus stands ready to remind the Father that he's already paid that debt of sin. And he did it with his own blood. So how awesome is it to know that Jesus is our advocate and high priest? So no matter how Satan may accuse us, Jesus is there to point to his sacrificial death, burial, and resurrection that sets us free from sin. Thank God we have like John 8, 36, which says, So if the Son sets you free, you really are free. Verse 2 says, He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only ours, but also for those of the whole world. You know, John wanted everyone to know that the privilege we enjoy as children of God is available to anyone. Since Jesus died for the whole world, the invitation is available to all. However, in order to receive this gift of salvation, one must be willing to confess their sins to the Lord. After all, that was the very reason why he died. If we will confess our sins to him, then he is faithful to keep his word to those who repent and believe the good news. And if we refuse, though, to confess our sins, then we will miss that opportunity to recognize our need for a Savior. You know, Robert Lowry wrote a hymn that's entitled Nothing But the, uh, <clears throat> Nothing but the Blood of Jesus. And they express this truth the best. Lowry writes, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. As we read in Matthew 26, 28, For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many a forgiveness of sins. John wanted his readers to know that the gift of eternal life is available to all who will come to Christ by confessing their sins to the Savior. As we look at 1 John 4.10, he repeated this important truth. It said, Love consists in this, that not, that not that we love God, but that He loved us. And He sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins, which is another way our atoning sacrifice. See, Jesus is the Savior of the world because He died for the sin of the whole world. And he went willingly. You know, it's not a tragedy of what happened on the cross. It was a victory. Jesus went because he loved us so much that he would die on the cross and shed his blood on that cross that we may have forgiveness of our sins. So remember that Jesus is the Savior of the world because he died for the sin of the whole world. And may we step out of the darkness, which is sin, and into his light. This is the Christian life. So let's look at the lasting truths from this section here in 2 John. First, our Savior lives, and He is now our advocate with the Heavenly Father. Secondly, as our advocate, Jesus reminds the Father that He shed His blood for all of our sin. Thirdly, once we understand the heavenly aspect of Christ's ministry as our advocate, we will better be equipped to live a victorious Christian life. And lastly, Jesus is the Savior of the world because He died for the sin of the whole world. So how do we live this out? Let's look at 1 John 5.13 one more time. And remember John said, I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. And as we look at this, how to live it out in our lives, we experience this forgiveness from Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, when we confess our sin and place our trust in Him. He is the one who makes forgiveness possible 
because of His sacrificial death on the cross. His blood covers our sin, and we enjoy fellowship with the Lord. Now we can go to Him whenever we are in need of forgiveness. So how are ways that we can live this out? And Paul also... We're missing, I can't, we're missing half the screen. I can't. It's too far over one one. <laughs> Let me look through this. I got this right here. So how are we going to live this out? First, examine your life. Paul wrote to this church at Corinth, test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. Examine your life in the light of the principles taught today, and they will either encourage you as a believer or convict you as a non-believer. Then align your life. Every day this week, spend time in prayer using Psalm 139, 23 to 24 as your guide. And it says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my concern. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. I say that every morning, folks, because I want him to be in control of my life. And thirdly, and last, express concern for others. Share your personal story of forgiveness with someone who needs God's forgiveness this week. Do not fear what they fear or be intimidated, but in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do this with gentleness and respect. So what's that saying? When someone comes up to you and they ask you, well, why are you so happy in these turbulent times? You know, and you know that they're struggling with it. Share the gospel. But do it like it says here with gentleness and respect. Don't be out there and saying, if you don't believe in this, you're going to hell. We're to love like Jesus. Just the gospel is the truth. And we're, what? is the truth. Remember Jesus said, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except by me. We need to know the truth and that is Jesus Christ. So folks, if you have not called on the Lord, if you have not confessed and realized that you are a sinner, and it's not about being a murderer or a thief or anything else. If you've taken a paper clip or if you've told a lie in your life, you're going to realize we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And once that one little sin is enough to send you to be separated from God from eternity, so you're going to realize that you need a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ. So you need to take that first step. You know what the answer is, that it is the toning blood of Jesus Christ for your sins. Admit that you're a sinner. Call on Him to forgive you of your sins and then ask Him to be your Savior and Lord. It's through faith. As Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, by grace, which is the riches of God has given us that we don't deserve, by grace we are saved through faith. Not by faith, through faith. And that is through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. So I pray for you today. I hope this has touched your heart. And that you would start a new life and be a new creation in Christ. I love you all. And if you need to talk or to ask any of us any questions, we would just love to talk. I mean, there's nothing better than to talk about Jesus Christ. You have a great day. God bless.